Okay, so this is an updated video on AP Bio lipids, uh, topic 1.5. So let's begin with a discussion of lipids in our everyday life. So some common examples, our first one we can think about are oils or waxes. If you ever had oil or grease on your hands, you know that water doesn't just wash it off. Um, so one of the major like properties of lipids is that lipids are generally going to be nonpolar and hydrophobic. And so when we look at examples in life of uh, plants, if you ever look at a leaf and it has a shiny surface, that's a waxy cuticle on the surface of the plant, that wax is nonpolar, hydrophobic lipid, that's going to prevent water loss from the leaf in that plant. Now ducks and seabirds have a, like a very large oil gland near their tail feathers where they put oil on their beaks and then they like spread the oil all over their feathers and it leads to a like waterproofing. So when they dive underwater, the water just repels right off their feathers and the cold water never touches their skin. You'll learn later in chapter or unit eight that uh, birds are also endotherms and need to thermoregulate. So keeping them nice and warm and insulated underwater is important. Now, mammals and other animals can also use fat, uh, lipids, fat, as insulation. So if you think about Arctic animals like this seal here, living in really cold environments, they're also warm-blooded or endotherms and need to conserve body heat. So they've evolved to have thick layers of blubber to trap in that heat. Now, in our unit four, we're going to see how some categories of lipids called sterols are used in cellular communication within our bodies. We have steroid-based hormones that are lipid and they're fat-soluble and how they interact with our cells um, is dependent on their nonpolar or hydrophobic properties. So we'll see more examples of lipids throughout our year together, but our three main types that we're going to discuss in this video are triglycerides and then we'll also talk about phospholipids and sterols. So our first one to look at, oh, phospholipids and sterols can both be found in our cell membranes. Now triglycerides are going to be like our fat that we store on our bodies. About 95% of lipids on earth are triglycerides. And um, when we get into unit three and we talk about the Krebs cycle and the mitochondria, we'll see how that fat is a long-term energy storage molecule. But anyway, let's go ahead and zoom in to triglycerides a little bit more. So you can see by looking at this image that triglycerides are made of three elements, C, H, and O, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Now, the component parts of a triglyceride, we have a glycerol, which has three carbons, some hydrogens, and some oxygens. And attached to that three carbon glycerol molecule are what we call three fatty acids. Now, if you look at the fatty acids, they are composed of hydrogens and carbons. Therefore, they're called hydrocarbons or hydrocarbon chains. And it's in the bonds between these carbons and hydrogens where that potential energy is stored. We'll see in the mitochondria and the electron transport chain how important those electrons are in that covalent bond and those hydrogens and their role in producing ATP. So we have lots of stored potential energy in these uh, bonds of the fatty acid chains. Now, you can imagine, if you were writing uh, or drawing a triglyceride, it would take forever to add all of those hydrogens and carbons. So the image on the left is like the shorthand version uh, the zigzags represent uh, carbons in that hydrocarbon chain. Now, it is super important to recognize that these fatty acids are nonpolar and hydrophobic. So when we use the word nonpolar, we can think back to our discussion on water, how a nonpolar covalent bond is equally sharing the electrons. There are no partial positive or partial negative regions on this molecule, and these fatty acid chains are equally sharing the electrons between the nuclei and they are non-polar and repel water. That concept is pretty important moving into unit two and our discussion on cell membranes. Now there are two different kinds of fatty acids. We have saturated and unsaturated. Now I like to think of the word saturated as meaning full. So if I were to look at these hydrocarbon chains, these fatty acid tails here, I can see that fatty acid one and fatty acid two are full of hydrogens. You cannot fit any more hydrogens on that carbon um, like skeleton. Now, if you look at fatty acid number three though, you can see it's not full. That one is unsaturated. There is a double bond between those two carbons uh, towards the end there. 
and that causes what we call a kink or a bend in that fatty acid chain. Now, the one that I just had arrived, let's go ahead and look at this one right here, you can see there are multiple double bonds. Each double bond is gonna cause a bend in that fatty acid uh, tail or that fatty acid chain. Now, why that is significant is because when we compare saturated versus unsaturated fatty acids, a bunch of saturated fatty acids with their straight hydrocarbon chains can pack really close together. And as they pack really close together, they form a solid at room temperature. You can think of a candle that wax at room temperature is solid. You can think about lard or Crisco in your cabinet or butter that's gonna be solid at room temperature or coconut oil. <laughs> Um, but if you think about unsaturated fatty acids, when they have bends or kinks, I don't know how to do it, in their fatty acid tails, they can't get very close together, and therefore they remain liquid at room temperature. And that's because of the double bonds between um, carbons within those hydrocarbon chains. Now, if I were to, uh, again, pointing out, they're all nonpolar and hydrophobic. Now, if I were to look at these four pictures, and think to myself, hmm, which one would be the most liquid at room temperature? Right, so you can hit pause and you can think about it a little bit. All right, all right, so good. Yeah, hopefully you chose C. If you look at C, that has the most double bonds, which means it would be the most fluid or the most liquidy uh, at uh, room temperature. Now, how do we build a triglyceride, right? So here I have that glycerol, and then here comes a fatty acid chain. So just like we saw in an earlier topic, probably 1.3 or so, uh, we can remove a water to form a covalent bond. Now, what process was that? Hopefully you thought to yourself, dehydration synthesis. So in the production of a triglyceride, we would have three waters removed to build those covalent bonds, linking the fatty acid chain uh, to the glycerol. Now, we need fat in our diets. This triglyceride is used for a lot of cellular components, but a main one being making our cell membranes. So if you were to take in fat in your diet, hopefully you do, uh, it's so large. This is a large macromolecule. How do we like break it apart so that it can be like taken into our cells? Well, we wanna think, well, what is the opposite of dehydration synthesis, right? It's going to be hydrolysis and we can add water and we can break apart the glycerol and the three fatty acid chains. Now we can use fat as an energy source. So these fatty acid chains can be chopped up basically into acetyl-CoAse for the Krebs cycle. We can also take like two glycerols and then convert them back into a glucose molecule to then be circulating in our bloodstream for maintaining blood sugar balance. So this is a great um, energy storage molecule for us. Now let's go ahead and talk about phospholipids. So here we have a phospholipid, and if I zoom in, it does look similar to a triglyceride. So if I write on this for you real fast, we can see here, this is our glycerol. And then here we have one fatty acid. Oh, it's unsaturated with a double bond right there. And then we have a saturated fatty acid. Now you see this third carbon. Instead of having a third fatty acid chain, instead there's gonna be a phosphate group attached. Now, one key thing about a phosphate group that we'll also see in nucleic acids and in ATP is that there's a negative charge right here. So when we talk about a phospholipid, let me erase this uh, ink for us. So when we talk about a phospholipid, we can break it into two parts. We have this phosphate group head, and then we have our fatty acid tails. Now, the phosphate group head, mainly due to that like negative charge, it's polar and hydrophobic, or hydrophilic and happy to interact with water. Whereas the fatty acid tails are still nonpolar and hydrophobic and repel water. So this one molecule, this one phospholipid has both hydrophilic and hydrophobic regions. And so the phosphate group head is hydrophilic, the fatty acid tails are hydrophobic. And when we have a molecule that has both hydrophilic and hydrophobic regions, we call that amphipathic. And I know my face is in, in the way of the amphipathic word, but I can't move my face right now. Uh, this is particularly important when we get into cell membranes. Now, I also want to point out, um, when we talk about lipids, lipids generally are made of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. But when you talk about phospholipids, we also have a phosphorus. So once in a while, you might, if you see a lipid that's CHO and a P, then they're referencing phospholipids. 
Okay, so when we talk about phospholipids, this is what makes up our cell membranes. Now, this center part is nonpolar and hydrophobic because when we talk about cells, all cells are surrounded in water. There's water outside of cells, there's water inside of cells. So if you have a phosphate group head uh, that likes the water, it's going to interact with the aqueous environment externally and internally. However, the fatty acid tails are going to face each other and repel from that watery environment. So when we talk about our cell membranes, they are actually made of a lipid bilayer because of the way they interact with water both outside and inside of the cell. Now again, this will be focused a little bit more in our unit two. Now our third and final category of lipids are sterols. Now in our class in AP Bio, we mainly talk about steroid-based hormones as well as cholesterol in this sterile category. It's also important to remember they are a lipid. They're made of C, H, and O. They are nonpolar. They are hydrophobic. But steroid hormones, they do travel throughout our body and are used in cell communication. When we get into unit four, when we talk a lot about how our cells communicate and how we maintain homeostasis, these chemical messengers, because they are nonpolar, because they are hydrophobic, they are actually able to pass right on through our cell membranes and our nuclear envelopes um, because the fatty acid tails are also nonpolar. So again, this is a topic for unit two, um, but these steroid-based hormones are able to diffuse right on through our cells and communicate within our cells and have influences on our gene expression and our DNA and which genes we turn on or turn off. And so examples of steroid-based hormones would be like testosterone or estrogen, cortisol, et cetera. Now, another sterol that we'll talk about is cholesterol. So cholesterol is important in our cell membranes for fluidity and making sure our cell, animal cell membranes aren't too fluid, but also not too viscous. So again, in chapter two, we will talk more about cholesterol's role in membrane um, uh, structure and fluidity. And then steroids are hormones that support our physiological functions, including growth, development, energy, metabolism, and homeostasis. So that rounds out our video on lipids, and hopefully this was helpful for you. Good job, good job.